<laughs> Welcome to the AP Podcast. Today we have Lana on the podcast with us. Welcome, Lana. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Austin. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm super excited because um, Lana is actually more of a strength and power lifting coach, and I haven't been able to talk to a lot of uh, that realm of, of strength training as much lately. So uh, I really want to dive in, and Lana actually works with a lot of female uh, competitors for powerlifting and strength, right? Yes, yes. I've been working with um, – I wouldn't say I work with competitors. I work with what we call junior pop uh, kind of people. Uh, basically, a lot of times girls or women come to me with the goal of doing or achieving sort of like weight loss, fat loss. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of segue them into powerlifting and strength training and wh what that can do for them. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I think that a lot of people start there with their body comp, right? But then they get into it and then they start liking the lifting heavier stuff and they're like, oh man, this feels good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's quite rewarding to see the mind shift that happens when, you know, a client first, you know, deadlifts her you know, body weight or like even 135 pound deadlift, mm -hmm. uh, when she squats something fairly heavy, it's, it's really interesting to see the change and how much more confidence, uh, usually clients gain when they, uh, really explore strength training and what their bodies can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you said, uh, you're telling me that you have competed in a, probably like a handful of comps now, um, a little less. Um, and you've placed uh, pretty well in that, that picture you sent me. You're pulling three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the picture that, that I sent, that was um, in October 2017. Uh, that was my third powerlifting meet, uh, which went pretty well. It was probably my most successful. I mean, I've done only three uh, competitions. Um, granted, mostly because I've been doing powerlifting for two and a half years. And, um, usually it's, it's a little bit different than bodybuilding, I'd say in a way that usually we don't want to do more than two competitions a year because it's pretty challenging, uh, for the body, um, mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, and, and programs usually take time. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyways, yeah, I did the competition. Last one was in October place in my it, it was a local meet, uh, nothing like national or anything, mm -hmm. um, not at that level yet, but we, we, we're going <laughs> for it eventually. Um, so yeah, I did the second in um, row uh, modern class, I believe, 165 pound um, weight class. 165 so. pulling 315? Mm, yep, that was my first 315 ever. It was very exciting. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's awesome, yeah. Most females are like, oh my gosh, I, I don't even, couldn't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, that was, I've, I've gotten a few comments about that from mostly my friends being like, damn, that's like really heavy. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it was pretty heavy. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Well, today I kind of want to go through for uh, the viewer or the viewers and the listeners um, on my end of things uh, mm -hmm. for females wanting to get into it. Um, say they start out with the body composition goals, like you said, how do you really transition them? Um, or how do you first start your programming with losing body fat and then starting with maybe more neural adaptation, kind of trying to gain strength and stuff like that? So when a person that, you know, it doesn't matter female or male, when they just start with strength training or when they would like to expose strength training for, um, specifically fat loss or like body um, recomposition goal. Um, I always start with the basics uh, because my philosophy is uh, like you, you got to have strong basics. No matter what it is you're trying to achieve, uh, fat loss, muscle uh, gain, you know, powerlifting, bodybuilding, uh, it's like you wouldn't build a house with a, without a strong base, right? You, 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 if, if you want the walls kind of be sturdy, um, you want to have a good solid base. So usually I go through simple, uh, workouts that include squats, you know, lunges, upper body exercises, some sort of a hinge. Um, it depends what they can do. Um, so usually I try to meet a client at 
where they at, and then we sort of go together. I do incorporate a lot of um, sort of uh, metabolic, you know, workouts, something like as many sets as you can, you know, a little bit of like, um, you know, 30 seconds work, 30 seconds rest, that kind of stuff. So I try to incorporate um, sort of a little bit of each in a workout, um, and then we'll go from there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, how do you, uh, in the beginning processes, kind of diagnose them for like poor mechanics or like trying to teach them the mechanics and seeing, you know, like dorsiflexion or hip mobility or just shoulder mobility or stuff like that. Um, can you kind of tell us how you would go about doing that? Yeah. So, um, usually I, when I first meet with a, you know, a client or a potential client, um, I just ask them to do movements, right? I don't really specify, well, we, we're going to go this because we, I want to see your dose inflection or whatever, because you, you and I, we know these terms, like we understand that general population people do not, like they could not care less what their inflection is, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, I usually ask them what they want to do in, like, what, what, what would they want to be able to do? Let's say, you know, if they want to squat 300 pounds or if they want to deadlift 200 pounds, right? So I would ask them to show me what in their opinion, deadlift or squat looks like, right? So a lot of my clients came to me, um, through, um, you know, they were taking like body jam classes, body pump classes, you know, so a lot of the group fitness classes. So mm -hmm. they usually would do something that they've been told to do there and that will go from there. Right. So, um, I usually will go through like, you know, squat and then the lunge, um, you know, some sort of like, you know, shoulder flexion, um, just to see how, how, how high they can move their arms up. Um, and then depends on what sort of not there, I'll give them like, you know, certain cues. So for example, if a client has a like knees cave in when they squat, I would either ask them, I would put like two kettlebells by their feet and ask them to push the belts out with mm -hmm. their feet so that when they squat, they actually realize that they need to use their, you know, gluteus muscles, their butt. Uh, you know, like when they do, let's say push up, you know, ask them to, instead of just dropping down to the floor, I would ask them to pull themselves to the floor and then push away. So mm -hmm. kind of sort of those things, it depends what they can and cannot do. And that will go from there. Awesome. Yeah, no, yeah, that makes hundred percent. Well, it makes sense to me, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. And I think that that was pretty broke, broke it down simple enough for a lot of people. If they're trying to realize how to get into a strength program like first thing is is if you get in and just start doing something you're gonna get stronger yeah. you know you haven't exercised before mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think that people are like oh I need to know the mechanics and it's like well it kind of depends on what you can do like what your body's allowing you to do um, so my next question for you would be so do you work with some people that do uh, powerlifting meets so recently <laughs> So that, that's a um, good question. I have recently just um, a few of my clients, four of my clients who they came to me to achieve some sort of a different uh, body physique than they used to have. Um, some were very fat loss specific and others were more like, you know, runners who wanted to gain a little bit of mass. Um, we started training uh, like power lifters without any specific goals in mind. Well, they didn't, I had <laughs> for mm -hmm. them. Um, so this past January, four of my clients did compete and their first power lift to me. And that was amazing. It was just my first time being a coach there, not a competitor. So that was awesome. Um, a lot of personal records. Uh, one of my clients that lifted 285 pounds, um, another benched 145 um so they did pretty well they, they placed in their weight classes so that was awesome it was wow. also like a local meet so they did awesome that's awesome yeah and i see that uh now with like the current research and stuff there's so much carryover with that type of training with uh, like you even even in endurance even though it's not mm -hmm. the same energy system kind of you know mm -hmm. but for some reason uh, and i don't know a lot about it but there's there's carryover into helping them in other aspects of of uh, training, but I was going to ask you, mm -hmm. how do you go about trying to ready your clients? Do you do some sort of linear periodization? Do you just do 
you know, a certain schedule blocks or, or what do you like to do? So I usually, because I, lo I work a lot of begin with beginners, um, I do linear progression, but still in blocks in a way. So um, because I've myself been trained in a way that you want to, if you want to be a um, healthy power lifter in the terms of like, if you want to have a long life as a power lifter, you really have to manage the fatigue and like sort of strength gain, gain ratio. So usually what happens when your fatigue is really high, you can't really get stronger. You can't really build, build muscles, right? So what we want to do is manage that fatigue uh, sort of line going up and make sure that, you know, it's, you're not overtrained. Mm. So what I usually do, I train my girls in blocks of um, 12 weeks, but I uh, break them in four weeks, right? So like usually every three to four weeks, I'll give them like a deload week. Mm. Um, so they, I do it for a few reasons, but mostly so that they don't get super exhausted with training because, you know, like I'm a fitness professional, fitness is my life, but it's not theirs, right? So they have jobs, some of them are moms, you know, they have a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I try to incorporate that or keep that in mind when I write programs. So I, I give them deload every three to four weeks. Um, and also, knowing myself sometimes i get tired of of lifting heavy it just like sometimes it's like shit i have to do that again <laughs> um so i know that mentally for me personally deload is really helpful in that it kind of gives me that anticipation of like oh my god i can't wait to get to the gym you know lift something heavy again same for them um because I, I you know i ask for feedback quite often um so i try to listen to them as well so yeah i would say 12 weeks you know um programs with we, we try to do like prs test out for personal records every 12 to 16 weeks gotcha yeah yeah i see that i usually like even though i'm more of hypertrophy based for my mm -hmm. uh, clients and stuff um i still like to really it kind of all depends on the body though right like genetics are going to play a huge role in recovery Absolutely. but but I guess for the listeners, can you kind of explain what that means though? Like having that block and then the deload, what, what is a deload? Like I'll kind of, so, so when people are trying to get into it right now, they don't go and just keep training and training and training and then thinking that, well, I don't feel sore, so I'm not making gains or when I get sore, that's okay. I'll just go through it and I'll still be okay. Um, so they don't for one injure themselves, but also try to optimize their progressions. So can you kind of explain that? Yeah, so well, usually, so the reason I do 12 week blocks, right? So if, if, let's say if you are a beginner and you really want to get into sort of powerlifting leg training, it doesn't have to be powerlifting 100%, but let's say strength training, but you are trying to achieve um, some sort of like a, you know, weight uh, gain in terms of like the numbers on the, on the barbell, right? So I usually go in like 12 weeks where we do four weeks of hypertrophy training, right? So we're trying to build muscle, right? So uh, very much bodybuilding style, including, you know, heavier um, weights with the main uh, lifts like bench and, and deadlift and, and squat. Then the next block, you know, next four weeks will be, um, you know, strength training, strength specifically where we still do a little bit of hypertrophy, but the main lifts are we trying to lift heavier for with the specific goal of making the muscle that we just built make it stronger right and then the last block will be the power you know power building in a way um where we still do a little bit of hypertrophy the main lifts are mostly power we do you know heavy for you know sets of one two or three but to make the muscle that we've built made stronger in the previous uh, four to eight weeks we want to make them powerful right mm -hmm. um, now in terms of deload um it's basically like i i usually say that you know strength training pretty much like a fat loss as well it, it's it's not a sprint you know it's a marathon so if you were to run a marathon you wouldn't like start sprinting right from the start right so let's say they're like 26 you know miles or whatever in marathon like you would want to pace yourself right mm -hmm. so that's what we do with the deal like you want to make sure that you don't over train your cent central nervous system so that you continue making gains your muscles um like even if you don't feel sore, you're still building them. Like soreness is just it. 
it's it's basically your your body is trying to um, you will get sore when you do something new, like some exercise or even a, a new number of sets or reps, right? So it's it's like oftentimes I don't get sore because I've been training for, you know, two and a half years. A lot of times I won't get sore. Like my last four weeks of training, not a single day, it was like, mm, okay, now I started new training. Every single day I can't walk. It's terrible. Anyways, <laughs> So kind of sort of getting back to the deal of it, it helps you to, it helps your body to sort of pace itself, right? Because a lot of, um, a lot of things are happening when you're building muscles. So deal of it helps you to recover and helps your body give a little bit of a chance to build the muscles, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't actually build muscles when you train, right? Mm-hmm. You build muscles when you actually rest, when you sleep and all sort of that things. Yeah. And I kind of want to, so there's two things, two things mm-hmm. that I want to now go into. Uh, this is really good. Um, so <laughs> first thing is you, you said you have your hypertrophy block, your mm-hmm. strength block, and I'm guessing your strength block is primarily with fourth force production, you're saying. And yeah. then power though, can mm-hmm. you give your definition of power? Because uh, do you know what I mean? Like, like how do you go about it? Do you do still more force production based or do you go velocity based based or what do you what do you like to do so with power lifting right so when the definition of power right here so with the power lifting the goal is to lift as much weight as you possibly can at this particular time right so like when you go let's say for the competition your goal is to deadlift as much as you can on that particular day given all the training that you've done, right? So when I say power for the, or in, in a way of like power lifting training, right? So what we do is we try to utilize every single muscle fiber in your muscle that you've built to do the work, right? Because when you do, let's say hypertrophy, you, you don't utilize every single muscle fiber, right? So you, you, you the, 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 the response that gets uh, that your body and your muscle gets from the strength training, right? Like it doesn't utilize every single one of them. Um, when, when I say the power lifting or oh, power in the power lifting, so basically let's say um, you probably have seen or like your listeners or, or, or um, years have probably seen those splits where they would say, you know, for hypertrophy, you need to do like between 12 to 15 you know, reps uh, for strength, you'll do, you know, between like five and seven, whatever, five or six, and then power, you'll do one, two, three, right? Yeah, so, okay. now I understand. So, yeah. So that's, that's what I say in terms of power, we'll, we'll try to do, you know, three sets of heavy singles, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that not only we train your body for power, but also there's a lot of mental training that goes in where you sort of feel the weight in your hands and you kind of, you know, try, because essentially if you do train, you know, what you could do, you know, three months ago, you know, you, let's say we're able to do the 315, three months later, when you do a solid, really good program, chances are that your maximum that was three months ago is not your maximum anymore. Right. So we might push it a little bit harder and see where you stand at. It still not might be your maximum, but in terms of a power lifting, it's still going to be considered as your power uh, based training. Does that make sense? That makes, yeah, the hundred percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've, I've done some videos on daily undulating periodization mm-hmm. where you go, yeah. and those, uh, you know, throughout the week, but I mm-hmm. like how I've actually experimented with myself in doing, more of a blocks of four weeks rather than just doing it daily undulating throughout the week um, and had great results from it from just pure linear progression with those blocks. So um, I would just want to get your definition of like power and strength because everybody's kind of different, you know, and if you go into CrossFit, it's different than powerlifting and all this stuff. So, um, well, um, CrossFit and powerlifting are absolutely different, right? So like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's funny. I had a um, client who came to me, a few who came to me from CrossFit and they wanted to do power lifting. And a lot of times I had to sort of pace them and stop them and being like, Hey, if you really want to figure out what is your true maximum that you can lift 
just for one repetition, right? Like you have to slow down a little bit because a lot of times, you know, in CrossFit, they will do, you know, I don't know, squats for five sets of 10, right? They will lift heavy, you know, they could do 25 to 25 pounds, but is it your really true maximum? Is it your true, you know, power? Um, so um, in terms of a definition, what is power to me? I mean, like, as I said, it's basically what your body, what your muscles can produce, uh, like when they put as much force into the movement as they possibly can. So that, that's what I would call power. Gotcha. So pretty sense? much as much motor recruitment. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, as much yeah. as possibly activating as much as you can. Gotcha. Yeah. No, no, I agree. I agree. Um, what about, so my second question, going back, mm -hmm. was uh, for the deload. So somebody's going mm -hmm. three weeks, they're going yep. hard as hell, and then at the end of the third week, they're starting to taper, starting to kind of like feel it. That mm -hmm week introing a deload do you like to regret uh regress volume or mm -hmm. intensity or how do you like to do a deload so i usually go by um so the way i write programs right i we, we don't just do uh just main lifts right so i do um you know two, four exercises that either main lift or main lift like. So for example, like bench press and then close bench press, right? But then we'll also will do some accessory work. So we'll do some, you know, dumbbell bench presses, overhead presses, all the, all the stuff. So I would usually deload, um, you know, I will decrease the usually intensity for the most part um, on the main lift. So again, for example, if you were to, uh, bench press for example um five sets of five um you know last week and then the uh, like let's say like 90 pounds and then you did five sets of four at like 100 pounds and then like four sets of four at 105 then your deload week i would do probably two sets of five at 50 percent of your current maximum so i would i would I would decrease intensity. Uh, that's what I usually do. Now the accessories, um, it depends because I would, I usually ask the way I write programs. I ask my clients about the feedback every single week. Right. So I just would look through the weeks, how they felt on the accessories. And then I will make a call with either will decrease the intensity or will decrease the volume. Gotcha. That gotcha. Makes sense? Yeah. That makes sense completely. Mm -hmm. Um, have you, do you, um, so you're going off of your uh, one max for, for percentages. Have you ever experienced or experimented with an RPE scale? Oh yeah, absolutely. So that's basically, that's the feedback I'm talking about when okay. I um, gotcha, ask my gotcha. clients. Right? And for people that are listening, RPE, all it stands for rate of perceived exertion. I rate think. of perceived exertion, right. Yeah. So I like to give RPE scale, um, for for the most part for the accessory lifts right so it's sometimes i'll like usually because i work with the um beginners like i know that what they usually for the most part tell or like the the way they choose it's not their true potential right because it might it it's it's something new you've never done before, the weight you've never held before in your hand. It will feel heavy, but the next time you'll come and you'll lift this weight, you'll be like, oh, shit, that's actually pretty easy, right? So that's why I ask and, and utilize the RPE scale very much often. With gotcha. Yeah. Down. That's good. Um, perfect. So then we got, our, we got our program, how you started out, different blocks, deloads percentages mm -hmm. um i guess do you do any sort of the nutrition programming for clients as well for that so i am a i do have a, the precision nutrition cert so i do call myself a nutrition coach i have done nutrition services so when i was working at the commercial gym i was uh, doing those too now i don't do it um like one-on-one -on -one sort of thing um i usually um like right now i'm working on a program like sort of course a nutrition course for my clients to sort of work together mm -hmm. um but uh, mostly because i do feel like I, I do get asked questions a lot they're all the same questions right uh, but the the main reason for working together as a group sort of is that clients need support quite a lot they need to see that 
it's they're not the only people who struggle with you know like late, late snack, snack eating what have you or like you know cravings and stuff so um currently i do not work as a nutrition coach uh but i do if that makes sense <laughs> like yeah. when yeah, no, no, you don't I work as primarily a nutrition coach but do you no. have a, a programming that you put in with the the training to try to optimize it or, or maximize their results with the strength gains um so yes and no um i do have like different uh packages if you if if you will so like there are some people who want to just program and then there's some people who want everything right they want to do nutrition and they want to do um you know strength training but f throughout my career i've been doing that for four years um i have found that simplicity is the best way to to go right so um if let's say i have a, let's say austin you came to me or hey lana i want to you know gain as much mass but also do a lot of power lifting but i also want to lose fat right so like everything <laughs> i want to do everything <laughs> all right so my my common guidelines would be hey try to eat protein with every meal eat bigger meals and don't eat as much snacks um, and then eat your carbs pre, peri, and post workout, and that's pretty much it, right? So it's very simple. Eat tons of vegetables. That's another thing. It's very simple. You know, you'll get your carbohydrates, most of them, mainly like within the you know um, timing when you you know do workout or about to do workout or you are doing the workout. Mm -hmm. So the carbohydrates will get to the use right there and right now, and then the rest, you know, protein and veggies will take care of itself. So that's about it. Perfect. Yeah, no, I, that's awesome. I agree hundred mm -hmm. percent. Uh, what I was going to ask is, do you, have you manipulated your diet at all going into a competition of structuring the macros a certain way? Cause it's going to be different. Well, at least I think it's going to be different because I've prepped people for bodybuilding. And so uh -huh. getting them sub 6% or whatever is a lot yeah. different than trying to be the strongest version of yourself. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, so I didn't know if there was some things that you know about for um, certain, like what I see with fats for like hormonal panels and stuff, like mm. helping strength, or if you don't really worry about it. I personally do not really worry about mostly because, um, so the, the only thing is that I usually personally myself do is I, I make sure that I eat a lot of carbohydrates, like enough carbohydrates. Um, throughout my training right but especially the last week week and a half before uh the competition because i really want to load on that glycogen right so that when i am ready to kill it you know there is something to support me mm -hmm. um that's what i usually tell my clients um the four girls that uh, we were getting ready for the competition in january um i told them to not worry about any like macronutrients or anything, but just eat carbs that you like basically every single day. Right. So like they were eating pasta and pizza, although they do it every, all, all the time. Um, but we don't really worry about it because I found that a lot of like my clients, a lot of, they are overachievers. So if I give them specific numbers, they're going to overthink it so damn hard. Yeah. It's going to, take away from the getting mentally ready for the competition right mm -hmm. and i'll take i'd rather have them eat whatever they want to eat a week before the competition kill it on the competition day and then get back to the you know whatever fat loss approach or like guidelines whatever um then just really think about everything super hard and completely poop on the competition that gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, now I was just wondering, uh, just because I don't know if, if there's obviously weight classes you have to meet. Yeah. Um, if there's any sort of, de I don't know when they even weigh you guys in and stuff too, but um, if it's the day of or the day before, or mm -hmm. if there's a loading, a loading phase, like a back loading phase, like you're mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. with glycogen, mm -hmm. um, that stuff, but also like during the year, mm -hmm. um, so you do like 12 week blocks. Yeah. And 12 to 16. And so um, is there like a point in time or do you go in cycles of maybe like trying to maintain a slight uh, calorie surplus during those, those blocks? Mm -hmm. And then is there like a structured like mini cut, you know what I mean? Or like a, a phase of like trying to come back down the body fat so then you can start the, 
progressions over again or how do you go about that? So I would say that's where powerlifting is very much different from bodybuilding, right? So the powerlifting is, is the, is it's, it's a sport of strength. It's not the sport of size, right? So unless you are going on a national level and you're competing, then yes, most likely you will be getting ready for your weight class you want to compete in probably six months before the competition, right? So you probably will eat a little bit above the maintenance, um, you know, in like a small surplus to help you build muscles. Then you probably will eat, you know, three months or like a little bit less at the maintenance so that you sort of utilize whatever fat cells you've got there, you know, for, for energy, but you also maintain the muscle or even build it a little bit. And then based on where you add, then you probably will do either a little mini cat or you'll just stay there. Uh, now, a lot of people, let's say if your listeners just starting with strength training and powerlifting, I usually say do not worry about the weight class. The number one mistake that people do um, or make on for their first competition, that the one that I did, is they get worried and they try to cut the weight for the weight class. It doesn't matter. Absolutely doesn't matter. It's really rare that someone came and like, you know, won the first place or what have you on the national level. Meet, you know, kind of sort of like um, the... the uh, you know, regionals or like local meets, yes, there are chances you definitely can win, but go there to experience, you know, to see what it is all about, you know, because like when I went for my first meet, I was completely ignorant. I had no idea what it was, did not bring any food. Like it, it was just a disaster, but that was an experience, right? So the same, like if, if any of your listeners decide to do powerlifting meet, do not worry about your weight class, right? Everything that you see on Instagram, you know, people lifting heavy and taking, you know, places and whatever, it will come a little bit later, but it will. Try not to worry, just as I said, eat enough carbohydrates to help you with training, eat enough protein, veggies, water, you're good to go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I know it's so, it's funny how simple it is when you can say it and people think there's this huge formula. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, those guidelines, I agree with a hundred percent. It all comes back to what you said in the beginning was building that foundation, building the house. Uh, pretty, much. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, it all does. And it comes back to that with pretty much, I think all sports. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I guess, Oh, that's all really great information. There's a lot there. Thank you, Lana. I appreciate that. Yeah. My pleasure. So if I was to kind of ask you, mm -hmm. um, for the listeners kind of wrapping it up, what would be like three things that you would suggest uh, doing if somebody's trying to transition into a strength gaining program or trying to get into powerlifting, whether it's male or female? Um, what would be three things that you would tell them to do? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a really good loaded question, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so number one thing that I would say that, um, as I mentioned is build your base, right? So make sure that your, you follow a really solid program that focuses a lot on technique, right? So you really want to know how to do squats and bench and deadlift with a perfect form for your build, right? Uh, like uh, it's basically find that works for you, but that doesn't compromise the form, right? Uh, that's one thing. Second thing would be uh, try not compare yourself uh, to other lifters uh, because a lot of times, Whatever you see on Instagram, all this, you know, crazy chicks that lifting, you know, 450 pounds or, you know, all the crazy guys, they have probably trained for a very long while, mostly, you know, five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. You just don't see it, but they've been, they've been doing that for a while. Um, and the third thing is if you are getting into the uh, powerlifting Really, I would highly recommend to find a coach who will help you because that's that's how I learned a lot about powerlifting, about the form, um, and he, my coach was really awesome help 
at the meat, right? If you can't, I, I get it, you know, a lot of times people can't really afford coaching. Um, try to find people at your gym who do powerlifting and try to learn from them because most likely they've been doing it for a while. Uh, they've, they've, they've had their, you know, successes and failures. Uh, if they are nice people, hopefully so, they will help you out. So mm -hmm. that, that would be my three. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I agree hundred <laughs> um, percent. All about the base. And I, even us being coaches, um, I would still hire a coach to coach me into anything. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's difficult to coach yourself and trying to, to just take all the mental part of it, out of it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, totally. hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Thank you so much, Lana, for being on the podcast today. It was such, honestly, really great information. I learned some stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm going to do, guys, uh, is put Lana's IG um, and probably her email and contact information in the description box. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to her. Also, I'm going to put my stuff in there as well. Um, so if you have any questions for me or if you would like to know more, uh, like have another topic to talk about, um, DM me and I would love to put it on the podcast. But other than that, if you liked all the information, if you love Lana, if you love Lana, give, <laughs> give us it a, a like. Give it a like. <laughs> <laughs> like the video. So. Like the video. <laughs> right, thanks so much, Austin. Um, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. We'll have to do it again soon, okay? 100%. You Perfect. got it, buddy. All right. Bye. <laughs>